Hey guys, welcome back. Well, this video has been a long time coming. I took pictures of the Horsehead Nebula back in 2019 with my then new telescope and mono system. And much to my surprise and displeasure, I found some rather large and obnoxious halos in the result. And I've always been meaning to go back to this target with the Antlia filters to see if they would correct for this problem. And so finally, four years later, I've gone back to this target and I've taken some pictures and I wanted to show you a comparison. Now, it's kind of an old topic by now. A lot of people have done some very good comparisons of how the Antlia filters perform relative to other filters, but I did want to put the uh, period at the end of the sentence here just for the heck of it. Also, I managed to capture a couple of other targets, IC342 and IC410, the Tapples Nebula, and I wanted to share those results with you and some of my thoughts in terms of processing and dealing with the challenges of those targets. So let's get started. The primary goal today is to talk about chasing a very faint target in Bortle 8 Skies, which is IC342 for me, and also, as I mentioned, revisiting my old friend on the talk when it photobombs our Horsehead Nebula images. At the time when I first imaged this target in 2019, I was using the ZWO SHO filters, the second generation version of those filters, and wow, where did those halos come from? This is my first experience with halos with using those filters. Otherwise, I think those filters are pretty good for the money, which is why I got them. As you know, when you make the step into a professional astrophotography camera, a dedicated astrophotography camera, a cooled camera, and you're going into the mono world, you're getting a lot of stuff. You're buying a filter wheel, you're buying filters, you're buying the camera. And in my case, I also uh, was buying a telescope to go with all that stuff. And so it's a big expenditure. And if you can save some money on something, uh, I was going to save some money on the filters. So I went with the ZWO filters and decided to play with those for at least several years before I finally switched to the Antlia filters. But I was never pleased with this particular target, even though I like it as a target. It's just that that obnoxious halo really jumps out at you. And there are some things you can do from a processing and a post-processing uh, standpoint to reduce the halo. And I did do some of those things. They still left uh, some features I was not happy with. And so this data set sat on the shelf, so to speak, for a long time. And I just resolved to come back to it one day with the Huntley filters to see if I could clean this thing up a little bit and make this a more presentable image. The second thing I wanted to do, since I had some imaging time and on the talk and it's Buddy the Horsehead Nebula don't get above my house until later in the evening. I wanted to shoot something when it was first possible to start doing some images. And about that time, the information was presented from the Euclid spacecraft, which just got out to its L2 equilibrium point. And one of the targets it had imaged was IC342, which is a very nice spiral galaxy. It's just that it's buried behind a star field from our own galaxy, and as a result, there's a lot of interstellar dust, which makes it a faint target. So I, I've always kind of ignored this target or pushed it down on the list, even though it's actually a, a very nice size target and a nice shape target if you like galaxy targets. But it is called a hidden galaxy for a reason because of all that dust in our stars uh, intervening or standing in between us and this particular galaxy. Nevertheless, I thought I would give this a shot since I didn't see any other good targets that were up at that time of night. Yeah, I wanted to see what I could do with the Antlia filters and see what I could do with IC342 and Bordelate Skies. Let's take a look at the targets that I was imaging. Now, here's obviously the Earth. I am located here on the Earth, not so much in the ocean, but at a latitude of 33 degrees north. The first target I'm picking up during this imaging series is IC342. It's at a declination of plus 68 degrees, about 9 million light years away. And if you set kind of an objective, an imaging objective for yourself, and you think, well, I'm just not going to be interested in taking images of a target if it never gets above 30 degrees above the horizon. Well, if that's, if that's your rough rule of thumb, then basically you've got to live above a latitude of eight degrees in order to see this target. So this is definitely a northern hemisphere target. It's a tough target. You've got to live in a Bortle five skies or darker probably to do this target justice. It's just the only target I could find at the beginning of the imaging session that I could use until the Horsehead Nebula came up. And about the time I see 342 reaches the meridian, that's about the time that the Horsehead Nebula appears above the back of my house, over the roof of my house. And here it's at a declination of minus two degrees, which is 
perfectly positioned uh, for most of us on the planet if you live between uh, roughly plus or minus 70 degrees. And then finally, when this target sets or gets low enough where I can't see it effectively anymore because of some trees in the back, then I have to switch for the final two hours of the night to IC410, which is the Tadpoles Nebula. I shot this nebula some time back. Uh, it's a nice target. It's got some good detail, good light. For me, it's particularly beneficial because it's at a declination of plus 33 degrees, which means it goes right overhead for me. Another thing that's kind of interesting that's totally unplanned is that the angular difference between these other two targets at IC410 or my latitude is about 35 degrees. Now, 90 degrees minus that 35 degrees is 55 degrees, which in other words, translates into the maximum altitude that both of these targets will get to through the night. So they will rise up and get to an altitude angular altitude of 55 degrees. This one rises up and gets to an angular altitude of 90 degrees. However, I don't think I ever shot this target at 90 degrees because it was the last one in line and I was focusing more on capturing data for Horsehead and then trying to rack up a lot of data for the IC342 since it's so faint. Nevertheless, these are all good targets and IC410 is a pretty good target. A lot of you guys in the south can see this target if you live above a latitude of 27 degrees. It's probably worth taking some time to image it. IC434, the Horsehead Nebula, is my primary target. IC342 is a nice challenge, and then poor old IC410 was relegated to, well, I've got some hours left, so why don't I, take, why don't I just take pictures of it for a while? Now, this is a picture of what I see 342 looks like when I first pick it up at the beginning of the night. This image over here, I created this program that I use to plan out my imaging to select targets and when during the year to best image those targets. And it turns out I'm imaging this target, I see 342 under the most optimum conditions, which means if you look at the hours that this target is visible, it almost has no visibility for me in the middle of May, but by the time you get up into November and certainly in just after in the first few weeks of December, this target, I get up to 12 hours of darkness on this target. So in theory, I could image this target for two, two and a half nights and I'm done with it. So that makes this target in this time of the month in December, the best time to image this target. Now, of course, I wasn't imaging it all night. I would just start with this target, and then by the time it got up to its maximum altitude, which, as we said before, is that 55 degrees that we were calculating, when it gets up to about 55 degrees altitude, I'm switching over and going over to the Horsehead Nebula because at that time, it's just now rising above my house. And that raises another thing. I do all this planning with Stellarium and then code this stuff in to Nina's Advanced Sequencer, but I think I'm going to start considering downloading and installing Nina's Orbiculum uh, plugin just so that I can take advantage of its features. The whole intent of the plugin is that it will take a look at the next target and you can set a trigger to switch from the first target to the second target once the second target gets above a given altitude. For example, your horizon, your local horizon, which is essentially what I was doing. Now, as we swing over to the Horsehead Nebula, Horsehead, as I say, gets above my house. I'm looking to the south, so I have to wait for targets to rise above the house. The houses here are two stories, and so it there's a pretty good altitude there by the time you can see a target rising above the uh, the house line. And there's Alnatok, our favorite star. It gets up to that altitude, as we were talking about, of 55 degrees. I can get almost seven hours of imaging on this target during the best of times, which for me starts around mid-November and goes through about the uh, end of January, beginning of February. And then if if I'm interested in this target between May and uh, September, you might as well forget it because you can't see it. So anyway, once again, I'm imaging this target during this period. I'm getting at best seven hours, but I'm exiting this target a little bit early just because I run into some trees at about 35 degrees altitude. And then from there, I switch over to the Tadpoles Nebula. And this target, as I said, gets to a maximum altitude of 90 degrees, goes directly overhead, which is awesome. Uh, and there's a perfect time to image this target is also in that first week, second week of December, when in theory, I could get about 11 hours on this target. So all these three targets I'm imaging during the optimal time of the year, and means I'm spending, have to spend 
a minimal amount of imaging time to capture a given number of hours on, on each of these targets. And then finally, I can cut off imaging this target when the sun altitude gets to a little bit higher than a minus 12. I use minus 12 as my cutoff for, quote, dawn, unquote. So let's go over to PixInsight and just walk through some of the data, and we'll be particularly interested in what the halos look like for the Horsehead Nebula. We'll start with IC342. This is an underwhelming target, if only because it's such a faint target and I have such bright skies. So here's the red channel data. I have, again, the Explore Scientific ED-102, about a 700 millimeter focal length. I also have the ZWO ASI 1600 camera, my first camera with this. So that kind of gives you a sense of the field of view that we're seeing here. It's a pretty good extent of this galaxy, even at this field of view. And if we didn't have all these stars and, of course, the dust that you can't get a direct measure of here, I think if this were more up out of the disk of our own galaxy, it would be as popular a target as M101 is. It's just a, it's a really great target. A lot of good detail potential there, but it's just washed out quite a bit with all of the dust. And that's one of the advantages, by the way, of the Euclid uh, Space Telescope is that it's looking at infrared. It can cut through a lot of that dust. But that's what the red looks like. The green is not very impressive. You can see that. And the blue is not very impressive either. And then finally, we get to the HA. There is some actually some decent HA in this target. And you can see the little nodules of HA and the spiral alarms here. So it's kind of... Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, this target has some pretty good HA in it. Plus, it has a nice little feature of some HA kind of like whiskers coming out of the core of the galaxy. So it's really, it's a very interesting target. It's just, it's just hidden behind all of those stars. And then finally, I get to the HA luminance. So now I've incorporated the HA data into the luminance. Here I have the HA and the RGB uh, combined. And once again, you can see this, the range of the galaxy here is pretty good for this field of view. And now it's a matter of combining these two data sets, maybe pumping up the colors here, improving the detail here, and bringing the two together. Now, when you look at this, you don't see a good any bit of blue here. It seems to be predominantly red. These have all been passed through the spectral photometric color calibration. The red, who knows, may be a result of some of the dust that we see. But it didn't stop me. I was going to put some blue in there, dog on it, and uh, nothing was going to stop me about doing that. And so this is what I ultimately came up with with my uh, maybe the third pass of this data. It's been a challenge processing this. There's some good HA. There is uh, probably due to my process and cheating in my processing, I probably have a bit more blue here than is legitimately there. But it's a, it's a nice target. It's just buried in a ton of stars, lots of stars you can see here. I think the next time through, I'm going to cut down on some of these really small stars and try to, try to uh, get rid of those some. The star field is a bit of the story here with this galaxy, so you don't want to go too crazy eliminating or diminishing the stars. You kind of want the stars to stand out a bit, if only because they are why this galaxy is called the Hidden Galaxy. I just think the really smaller stars here, the fainter smaller stars are a bit more distracting than are aiding with that story. But anyway, that's the processing I can come up with on this galaxy. It is a challenging target. I can't say that I'm going to go back to this target, but so those of you who live in darker skies, and as I said, in the Northern Hemisphere here, you might want to give this a try. All right, let's go over to IC410. We won't spend too much time on this one. One thing I did differently taking pictures of it this time, as opposed when I first took pictures of it, which may have been back in 2019 as well, is that I get the RGB, maybe 20 minutes, a channel. There's the red, there's the green, there's the blue. And then all I do is just pull out the stars from that RGB and spectrophotometric color calibrated image of the stars. They have a distinct bluish hint. I don't know some of that may be from pulling out some of the background red and draining that red from the stars. I'm not sure. But anyway, those are the color calibrated stars that I have. And then on the nebula side, I've got the S2, some decent S2 with this target. It's a good target. And also with hydrogen alpha, as we expect, a lot of good signal with hydrogen alpha. And of course, with oxygen, we're getting some decent oxygen as well, which in the end, 
leaves you with a pretty good starting place when you just combine those images and get your first SHO view of this particular target. And then when you process the target, you can come up with something that looks like this. I'd make some changes with some uh, uh, modification of the green. I think one of the things I need to do better as I make my nets pass through this is to uh, process it so these tadpoles stick out a bit more. The stars that I'm putting in is the star field that we were just looking at. I blend that back in in the end. Uh, may want to dial back on the stars a bit, but by and large, I'm I'm not displeased with this. I'm more displeased with the processing of the nebulosity than I am with the size of the stars. And then finally, let's go over to the star of the show, which is the comparison of ZWO filters from my 2019 image of the horse head with what I'm getting with the Antlia filters in 2023. Let's compare with the HA and uh, with the Antlia filters, I'm not seeing that halo with the uh, that I am seeing with the ZWO filters here. So that's good. You'll notice I also changed the framing. I cut out some of this sky here that's not terribly of interest. I wanted to capture the top end of this nebulosity here, which I cut off of here. Uh, so I made some changes to the framing here, just trying to maximize the area of interest in the nebulosity and cut out some of this darkness down here. But that aside, you can see that we don't have much of a halo. We have the S2 image here with the ZWO filters, and now we're seeing that halo. And here with the S2, we aren't seeing a halo. There's just a bit of a halo with the S2 3 nanometer uh, filter from the Antlia set. This is a 7 nanometer ZWO S2 filter. And so I am seeing something here in the S2, but obviously less. And then, of course, the, the ZWO oxygen 3 filter and now you can see we have almost almost everything in this picture is dominated by that by that darn halo that we're seeing here you can see a bit of the flame there's nothing much coming from the horse head itself and then over here uh, we can see a, a halo and maybe some reflections out here and a little bit of the flame so i was actually surprised when i did this comparison initially and looked at this i thought wow i thought i was going to get a lot better results but it turns out when you combine these, the halos that we're seeing in the Antlia filters aren't actually translating in mass to affect, or at least affect the image as much as what we're getting out of the ZWO image. So here's the processed image I had from 2019 with the ZWO filters. And I, this is no attempt to reduce this halo here, which you can see is predominantly blue, meaning predominantly coming from the O3 data. And then over here, Here's what I'm getting now. I can still see the micro lensing effect, so there may be some things I can do to mitigate that, but I don't mind this picture as much. This one was set the data on the shelf and come back to it some other time. Uh, this, I can actually live with. The halo doesn't dominate the picture like it does over here. So I have to say, even though I, I saw those halos in the oxygen filter and a bit in the S2 with the Antlia filters, uh, the end result doesn't leave me with a picture where I've got to worry about star halos. It doesn't it doesn't dominate the view. So I'm actually much happier with this image here than I was with this image over here. Now, if we zoom in and register the picture so that they are oriented the same, you can kind of see a more direct one-on-one uh, -on -one comparison of the two areas. You can see the we still are, still are getting some of those microlensing effect here and a microlensing effect here, but I'm not seeing the reach of the halo as, as prominent as we are over here with CWO. So by and large, uh, I think it's been a very good improvement uh, with the Antlia filters. I still like the Antlia filters quite a bit, not unhappy with them at all. And I think they make this target, and let's face it, uh, All the Talk makes this target a, uh, a, bit of a, uh, a bit of a beating because it's such a bright star that wants to dominate this, this type of picture in this field of view. And having the Antlia filters, I think, does a great job of cutting that down a bit and make it a much more tolerable uh, part of the picture without it just dominating everything you see in the picture. So, yeah, still quite happy with the Antlia filters. But it all started back in the days. There was two targets that I have been imaging that made me go out and look for other filters. One of them was on the talk, and this thing's a killer. It just any bright star like this will uh, really uh, make an impact on your image if your filters aren't up to snuff. Also have an issue mostly because of my my bright skies here. 
the Flying Bat and Squid Nebula. I've gone after this target twice and still I'm not happy with the results. The squid part of the nebula is the is a very weak O3 signal buried in the flying bat part of the signal, which is mostly sulfur and uh, hydrogen alpha. And so, yeah, trying to pull that weak oxygen signal out is a is a challenge. The Antlia filters at three nanometers certainly do a better job than the seven nanometer uh, CWO filters, but I'm still having issues with that. But a lot of that comes down to just the nature of my skies here in Portal Eight. Uh, I still see the halos, as we saw with the Antlia filters, particularly in oxygen, a bit in S2, not so much with HA. You don't have to do any extra post-processing removal of halos as I would have had to have done with the ZWO filters. So all in all, that's a pretty good result, and I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I'm still on board with the Antlia filters, and we'll continue using them. I don't have any uh, plans to upgrade my filter sets at all. I highly recommend the Antlia filters, but they're not the best filters out there. Okay, There are better filters. Uh, you'll pay for them, uh, but there are better filters out there on the market. I just think the Antlia filters are a nice little balance of uh, value and performance and money. One of the things that I keep thinking of with this Horsehead Nebula is I might want to go back and try taking an equal amount of data, perhaps, in RGB and SHO and combine that, maybe put for the red channel be a combination of the red, the hydrogen alpha, and the sulfur two. And then the green channel, of course, the green and the O3 and the blue, the blue and the O3, and see what that does. I think there might be some, might be an interesting combination. If some of you have tried this combination with your horse head nebula images, let me know what you think of that process and if it's worth going back to do that. And then there's IC342. What a great shaped spiral galaxy. Large, it's, it's even good enough target, large enough size target for my 700 millimeter telescope. You don't have to resort to the SCT or to a thousand millimeters, 2000 millimeters to uh, get it into the field of view at a respectable size. So it's a good size target. It's just buried behind a lot of stars. And uh, as a result, you probably need darker skies to try to get through some of the imaging challenges with this particular target. But it's got a lot of good HA in the target. Uh, it's good structure to the spiral galaxy. And one of the things that I've been noticing as I go back and process galaxies and then go back to older data and reprocess galaxies, my general process of removing stars, processing the nebulosity or the galaxy, and then bringing the stars back in is something that I do and will continue to do with nebula targets. But I'm finding that the process, at least it seems to me, that I'm getting better results when I don't do that with galaxy targets. I think I tend to lose something with the HA and the target when I take the stars out. Some of the HA may be identified as a star and pulled out and some may be uh, left behind. And there's something about recombining the stars, the HA that are masquerading as stars uh, back into a galaxy image that really diminishes the impact of the HA and the image. So I think I'm I'm kind of gravitating to changing my processing with galaxy targets and just keeping the stars in from the beginning to the end and just dealing with the challenges that having the stars there presents, such as ringing when you're doing some sharpening and that sort of thing. But there are ways of dealing with that. But I think I do get better results with the uh, leaving the stars in than removing them and trying to put them back in. And then there's good old IC410, the Tadpoles Nebula. Uh, good target, one of the targets I shot very early on. It's great for me because it goes right overhead, so that's nice. I think I need to work on, with the data set I currently have, trying to bring out more of the contrast to bring the Tadpoles out more. And I'll be doing that. That was my first uh, processing uh, pass through the data that I just recently got. And it's always good to go back and revisit data. You like to take a one, two, three passes through the data. I never get the same results twice when I go back and reprocess data. So uh, what the heck, maybe just uh, by throwing a dart at a dartboard, I'll get better results the next time through. Big picture from this imaging session for me is that there are always reasons to revisit old targets and to try imaging new ones that you might put on the back shelf because of particular challenges with those targets like IC342 for me. But even just going back to IC410, going back to the Horsehead Nebula, it's very useful to go back and revisit those targets. So even though we might say, well, I've already imaged the Horsehead Nebula, why would I want to go back and take a picture of it again? Well, there are many reasons why. Maybe you're trying to get rid of the halos. Maybe you want to try a different uh, 
combination of data to see if you can bring out different features that you're perhaps missing with one palette combination versus the other. So I think that's a good thing about this hobby. There's always reasons to go back and look at and revisit uh, targets from your past imaging experience. Well, for me, guys, that's all I have for today. So clear skies, and let's just keep plotting along one pixel at a time. Take care.